Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome back to session four of this year's conference. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed the uh, showcases, the three showcases that we had running. A quick reminder, of course, because uh, you weren't able to watch all three of those as they were running in parallel. But for the two that you didn't watch, those were recorded and the recordings are going to be sent out to you immediately after the events. So you'll be able to, uh, to watch back uh, those ones that you recorded that you uh, possibly missed there. And of course, any other sessions that have taken place today that you haven't been able to follow live, the recordings for those will also uh, be made available immediately following the conclusion of today's events. So to get on then with the final session of uh, day one of the conference, um, this session is going to be looking at uh, delivering the goals of the uh, EU uh, secure connectivity constellation. So looking at the EU constellation. Um, so really looking forward to this session, uh, something that I'm sure there's going to be uh, a lot to discuss on. Uh, so to introduce the issues in a bit more detail and, of course, to uh, welcome our speakers, I'd like to now uh, welcome to the stage uh, Arti Holomaini uh, from ESOA. Arti, welcome. Lovely to have you with us. As I said, really looking forward to this session. So uh, without further ado, I will pass over to you. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be here again. And hi to everybody and a very warm welcome to this uh, session on delivering the goals of the EU Secure Connectivity Constellation. So with Commissioner Breton's initiative um, for this constellation, satellite communications are receiving some long awaited attention. With it comes the hope of finally connecting the last few percent of European uh, citizens who are still unconnected and extending the reach of 5G services and enabling key verticals and bringing increased resilience to terrestrial networks as well. All of these hopes are out there. But this is not just about connectivity. There's actually a much bigger picture here with this initiative. Uh, we can see that what the Commissioner really wants to ensure is that Europe does not remain merely a customer of next generation services and capabilities that are developed outside the Union. He wants to make sure that we can also develop the jobs, the skills, the knowledge and the business ecosystems inside Europe to benefit from emerging areas of economic opportunity, which do lie in, in digital and where satellite has a critical role to play. That's why this project is so critical for Europe. But can the Commission make it a reality? Are there ways of accelerating progress so that a European system can actually compete with other systems being developed elsewhere? How can we make sure that this isn't Galileo revisited? There are many interesting topics that we're going to address today, and I'm sure that you also have questions. So please don't hesitate to post them into the, the session chat, and we will try to get to them later. But if I can introduce our panelists today, we're going to be joined by Gustav Kalbe from DG Connect at the European Commission, Christophe Allemand from the Telecoms and Integrated Applications Directorate at ESA, Ferd Kaiser, Senior Advisor to the CEO of SES, Chris McLaughlin, Chief Government and Regulatory Engagement at OneWeb, Marc Henri Serre, Head of Telecoms at Thalassolania Space, and Jean Hubert Lenot, Chief Strategy and Resources Officer at Utilsat. Thanks all for joining me today. So we're going to start with some introductory remarks from our panelists. And if I can just hand the floor over to Gustav, uh, we can start with you. Thank you. Thank you, Arti. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity that uh, we have quite a wide audience to give you a short introduction overview of uh, what uh, concrete terms uh, the secure connectivity means. Uh, the Moderator made a very good introduction of uh, what is at stake, why is it so important for uh, our commissioner to take action, and also important for uh, the whole uh, uh, industry. The, the space uh, policy is the, the baseline for what we see in secure connectivity. By, by all means, you should not see the, the space policy uh, in isolation. If you look and read uh, in detail the various policy documents that uh, the Commission has been publishing in the last uh, few months and uh, last two years, uh, you will see that the, the concept is bringing together a number of different policies. One, of course, is the, the space policy uh, driven to some extent by the increased autonomy that uh, our Commissioner, that Europe wants to get in space of being less dependent on uh, certain actors that have uh, control of a part of the value chain that we're missing in Europe. Linked to that, of course, is then the industrial policy, which uh, takes advantage of this drive to get more autonomous in accessing space, 
by looking at the innovation, looking at new concepts, new industry, the whole idea about new space uh, that uh, should uh, be flourishing through the whole initiative. And in that sense, also uh, linking it, of course, to the digital priority of the, the Commission. Uh, let's not forget that the transition to digital is the second priority of the present uh, Commission, and therefore secure connectivity is an integral part of, of that, providing not only connectivity to the, the European uh, citizens, the European enterprises, the, the public sector, the, the governments, and so on, providing connectivity on places where it did not exist, but also at a level of security that is commensurate with the, the, the challenges, uh, with the uh, threats that we have on our uh, whole digital ecosystem, not just on the communication itself, but as part of the whole digital uh, transition. And that's why, for example, if you uh, look into more detail uh, about the, the concept of the secure connectivity that is being built up, you will find not only uh, discussions on involving actors of new space, but putting innovative technologies like quantum key distribution. Uh, in, in Europe, we have been traditionally very strong on quantum technologies. We are at the level where the technologies for QKD are mature to add a layer of security at the, the communication level, including at the satellite level, but of course then integrated also with the terrestrial communication networks. Now, we're not yet at the in a position to present to the blueprint how the secure connectivity look like, uh, what type of satellites, which orbits, uh, in what combinations, uh, what uh, the different technologies will be like. Uh, this is the discussion we are now finalizing with the help of a number of studies that we had uh, uh, procured, working also in cooperation and discussion with our colleagues from the European uh, space agencies to define the architecture of the secure connectivity covering the different uh, technology layers, but also looking at it from a mission perspective. What is the type of services we want to offer? Uh, highly secure governmental uh, services, uh, more commercial services for, for banks, for critical infrastructure protection, uh, whatever. Question on what will be the final bill that we, uh, we need to, to pay and what financial instruments we're going to use to get there. These are also still uh, to be discussed uh, once we know what are the mission requirements, what are the available technologies, we can then build the overall architecture. And finally, the question we are also going uh, still to resolve is what is the governance we're going to use uh, for the whole uh, secure connectivity uh, network. Uh, will it be a private actor, a public actor, a combination of both, depending on the type of service? Uh, these are all a number of options that we're currently exploring uh, together with the different uh, market actors and which are the scope of the preliminary studies that we have been running, which should close by the end of uh, December, so that early next year we can then really start with the deployment of the secure connectivities, deployment in phases, building up gradually the, uh, the capabilities, deploying the network, but also working on an increase of technology and, uh, of course, in providing the right layers of security and confidentiality that we would need for this type of network. I will stop here with my introduction on the subject and I'm looking forward to the discussion and the questions that you will raise. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Thanks very much. Christoph, if I can come to you, if you could share the European Space Agency's perspective with us. Well, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, of course, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Uh, we have a great enthusiasm about uh, the Secure Connectivity Initiative, and I want to explain briefly why, explaining and reminding you what the role of the European Space Agency is. But for sure, this is a very important uh, initiative for the European space sector, and in particular for the European space industry. Uh, well, uh, let me remind, so very briefly, uh, what the pro telecom program of ESA is doing, so ARTES is doing. For more than 20 years now, we have been here to partner with our uh, private partners, operators, manufacturers, service providers, to help them be innovative, competitive, and so on. So bringing the support of the public side to their initiative and project for the market worldwide. And we did so really through 90% of 
partnership for techno development, for end-to-end -end system development. So partnership is really at the heart of, uh, of Artes. The second objective we have is really to help our, our, our member state or their public organization, vertical public organization and so on, to really uh, trigger their initiative related to the SATCOM domain, define what they have to do to respond to their high level objective and of course implement their initiatives. If we can help, we do so for any group of our member states, all together or part of them. So it is really what we have been doing for 20 years and we will continue to do. Our member states actually have the very good perception of where the market and demand was going three years ago, because at the last ministerial council, they decided to create what they call a strategic program line for those next generation that come solutions that were very much focused on addressing uh, security requirement, uh, sovereignty requirement, and so on. So when a member state or a company or whatever has some strong requirement, not only related to the cost of the megabit, but to the security part of it, to the sovereignty dimension, to the resilience of its infrastructure, you have specific solution and our member state required ISA to dedicate some energy and focus to this kind of solution. So it is what we have been doing for the last three years and will continue to do. So you can really understand uh, upon this basis why we are so much enthusiastic about this uh, secure connectivity initiative. Actually, the first point is that it is a very important initiative and I will detail this, but also we have to take note that it is part of a set of initiatives that are under our Artes member state perimeter, so Europe and Canada. Today, in addition to uh, very ambitious projects, uh, geostationary satellite for internet and so on, we have three constellation projects that are today, I would say, under this footprint in Canada, with the UK lead with OneWeb and now the EU Secure Initiative. So it really emphasizes that the market is going there and that we need to increase our effort uh, to, uh, to design and deploy very quickly uh, this kind of uh, solutions. And it is what we want to do. So again, I want to stress uh, uh, what is very important is that in the telecom market, uh, private initiative and investment is key. And when the public side has some requirement, probably the best way to do it or the only way to do it is, it is, uh, is to articulate sorry, the public initiative and support with the private initiative. It is exactly what we have been doing in our test through developing again the technology with our private partners for 20 years. So it is a key dimension and probably it will be a key dimension there. Why we are so much enthusiastic with this secure connectivity initiative is that it's not only a constellation, it's not only a Leo constellation or whatever. It is an overarching infrastructure. And really when we look at all the ambitious uh, requirement and the service to be addressed really the, really uh, what we can see is that uh, this infrastructure to respond to all these needs will cover all kinds of advanced solutions that can be imagined today from broadband to low data rate from leo constellation to advanced geostationary satellite and so on so Whatever we have been preparing with industry and operators over the last 10 years, it is happening in one initiative. And of course, it is to be added to, again, I said, ambitious projects that exist in the UK or in Canada. So we are very active under, uh, under our test to help all these initiatives and, of course, especially secure connectivity initiative because of its importance for uh, Europe and for our industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Great, great to hear your your uh, your introduction there. Ferd, if I can come to you. Uh, Ferd, SES is involved in the Commission study. What are your main thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Anti. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for for Rui, who, for reasons uh, beyond this control, if I may say so, couldn't do it this afternoon. Now. Uh, coming back to your your question and um, a, a couple of um, introductory comments from my side. So first of all, when um, the Commissioner Breton introduced the, the concept of the ESSCS uh, about 18 months ago, 
I have to admit that uh, within ASEA, some of us were somewhat skeptical. So looking at all this um, from an operator's point of view, um, we, 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 we had serious questions. And, um, but then step after step, dealing with uh, more and more details, uh, digging into the depths, we came to the conclusion, we realized that in fact, the commission is absolutely right that in order to anticipate the increasing uh, competition coming from outside the EU, that in order to deal with the digital divide, that in order to deal with uh, cybersecurity and so many other topics, we need this additional secure and sovereign infrastructure. In other words, we at SES, we share, we support the uh, European Commission's uh, vision to build an autonomous, resilient, and uh, future-proof uh, infrastructure, being able to deliver secure and affordable, and of course affordable is very important here, secure and affordable connectivity to the EU citizens, to the various um, um, government institutions in the various European member states, and of course to the um, uh, all, all kinds of different uh, businesses across the EU. Our understanding is that um, there are four main objectives. The first one is to bridge the digital divide and to provide broadband via satellites to the citizens in uh, unserved or underserved regions. Second main objective is to become autonomous and to avoid dependence on non-EU architecture for critical infrastructure and government communication needs. Third main objective is to provide backup communication capabilities from space in case of emergency, including massive cyber attacks. And the first one is to enable quantum encrypted communication. And from these main um, objectives, many use cases have been um, deducted. And our view is that um, in order to, um, the, 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 to, to, to deal with all these use cases, the European Commission should facilitate the deployment of what I would like to call an integrated multi-orbit constellation by gradually uh, deploying, scaling up, and of course, leveraging existing and committed GEO and MEO assets. And of course, all this to be complemented by LEO assets all this ideally in a single frequency band. Our understanding is that only the combination of the assets at the three different orbits is the way to take full advantage of the relative merits of each orbit based on the relevant uh, use cases. Of course, the deployment of such a constellation will have to be financed. Um, and here the Commission is proposing um, or suggesting a PPP is a concession-based model or an availability-based model. Um, we have a certain preference uh, for the so-called availability model. Um, and um, yeah, for us, um, all this is going to be a, a journey. There has been a point of departure, which in our understanding was the RFP for the ESSCS study, in which together with the other partners, we are in a consortium and we have a deadline end of the year. And then there will be a point of arrival, uh, but in the meantime, many, many other points have to be clarified, in particular also on the regulatory side, the legislative process um, has to be clarified. Timing is of an important asset. But um, yeah, in, um, to, to summarize, we are prepared and we are committed to be part of this exercise. Thank you, Ferd. Um, let me bring Chris in. Chris, can you share one web's thoughts on what's happening here? Well, I, I will, and, and they're really very similar to the thoughts that are being articulated by everybody. As, as, as we know, we had a little, um, little disagreement with Europe that resulted in a, a a divorce, but it hasn't altered the geographical reality of where we all live, or indeed the um, the need to develop uh, technologies together and the need to respond to a rapidly changing world. Some of us were at Global Millsat last week, and we'll be extremely aware of the challenges, specifically in the uh, in the Pacific and elsewhere, that um, we all face. And um, I think, echoing what Ferd just said, 
the emphasis has to be on using all the platforms. Indeed, that was what much of the talk was about last week. So the Leo, Geo, uh, Mio solutions are undoubtedly the best way to go. And just around this platform here, you've got everything you need. Uh, you also have uh, Utelsat, who are one of our um, major shareholders, and I'm sure um, John Hubert will have things to say along the way along there as well. But the the reality for all of us, uh, as we think about a European uh, Leo, is uh, when and how, and how do we afford it, because we live in COVID-straightened times. And the reality of all of that is, well, how about now? How about doing something straight away? How about utilizing something that exists already, something that was built by Airbus, flown by Ariane, and whose many key engineers um, are from Europe? Indeed, our CTO and our CDO are both um, from Italy. So it's a bit of an artificial construct, I think. And I think that the uh, ESA uh, approach is a very good one, uh, looking at the different ways to uh, find a solution and find several solutions. Um, they, they talk about Canada. They talk about the possibility of a Canadian uh, Leo along the way. Um, that's possible if um, basically if BPI is going to put five billion into the manufacture of the satellites, maybe they will. Um, but it also puts time and delay into the, the process of what we want to do. I think if we were looking as, as, as one web and the things you want to do, the, the resilience, the, the quantum key distribution, uh, the, the need for a resilient uh, PNT over and beyond uh, stationary and eager to, easily targeted satellites, you'd have to say that uh, LEO would be in the shopping list. Um, you'd also have to say that the, the, the effort to deal with financing um, is a delaying factor. And some of the projects like Galileo, as mentioned earlier, have taken many, many years to, to ratify and utilize and to get the parliament and elsewhere to uh, agree. And budgets will certainly be a big challenge in the EU. So I suppose from a, a, a OneWeb perspective, um, what, what we're saying is that why don't we use this European asset? Why don't we accept that um, the, the, the LEO is there? It can form a powerful uh, contributor to progress within the EU straight away. And it can do so um, through UTELSAT, if you wish it to be through UTELSAT. It doesn't have to be uh, from the, 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 the uh, UK-based company. Uh, and it can also partner with um, some of the brilliant services that you have from SES as well. I mean, you really do have everything you want on your doorstep now. And if we were to look at the, uh, the concept of secure and sovereign, no question, um, you can have a secure sovereign uh, one web immediately with your own levels of encryption that you can place into the system. We also have um, a number of routes that will go down uh, on how we could facilitate uh, an EU LEO for you. Uh, we might decide that you want to learn the way using the existing uh, Gen 1, and you might decide that you want to work with us on a Gen 2 development, which may well be a European-based satellite anyway, or you might decide you want to build your own. The thing to remember is that OneWeb has uh, filings for significantly more satellites than uh, are currently planned to be built. We're only going with 658, including the spares. So there's entirely a capability to offer the EU the filings um, uh, to put their own system in um, over time, if that was of interest to you. Uh, we would be happy to provide access to space either in partnership together or working with you in a similar way that Light Squared worked with Immarsat uh, to provide um, a platform for them and access to Spectrum in return for payments. But those are all things that you might want to look at. Um, I think that the, the, the key thing here is to adopt that space has changed so quickly now that we, we're we all expected to turn quickly and to take new opportunities and to be very agile. So here is an opportunity to do something which maybe uh, traditionally you wouldn't have done, but to recognize that everyone else is doing it, to recognize that China has aspirations for a, a, a low earth uh, LEO system, to recognize that the US is already building out Starlink with a huge number of satellites, to recognize that Amazon wants to do the same, which again is the US, uh, and to recognize that you can lag by a decade or you can come in with OneWeb. So I suppose I'm here today to say to you all, put Brexit behind, let's look at the practicalities of what we're trying to do, and let's try to work together. Let's try to have 
not just a French flag on the side of, of our, our launch fairings, um, but let's have an EU flag on the side of our launch fairings and, and let's be partners with the whole satellite community, uh, which is represented here on the call today. Um, I'll, I'll pause there, Artie, because as you know, I can talk forever on this, but I'll step back. Excellent, thank you. It was a very constructive um, picture that you painted there. Thanks for that, Chris. Okay, Mark, uh, Marc-Henri, if I can bring you in, we'd like to hear uh, Talis Alenia Space's view. Okay, thank you, thank you, Artie. Uh, first, um, uh, digital technologies have, have grown at a very fast, fast pace, and, uh, and this trend will continue over the next years, I think. And uh, it's it's uh, fine. The, in this in that regard, European Commission is, is right to uh, to invest uh, in this domain. Uh, Task point of view um, is that the added value um, of such a, a European constellation uh, can address uh, three main needs. The first one is capacity to bring more capacity to the users. And in that regard, uh, the, the future constellation should be designed with state of the art technologies that can help sustaining the, the, the growing needs uh, for digital capacity. The, the second one is uh, not, rest, not restricting uh, connectivity, sorry, not restricting uh, uh, connectivity to wealthy and, and dense area, but ensuring equal opportunities um, uh, by bringing connectivity everywhere uh, at any time uh, to all the European citizens and uh, institutions. And to do so, uh, a global coverage is absolutely key. Um, and the third uh, third point is ensuring uh, resilience and cybersecurity. My, my colleagues uh, already mentioned that, but it, it is a very important point. With with our expertise uh, at Thales, we know that the more the digital network expands, the higher the risks of cyber attacks is, and uh, this is an issue where public investment uh, can largely be uh, be justified. Uh, on top of that, uh, this European constellation will bring sovereignty and autonomy. It, it has already been raised by, by, by my colleagues. And as you know, um, European space industry is uh, uh, at the forefront of the worldwide competition uh, in the commercial uh, telecom market, whether uh, considering geostationary or non-geostationary satellites. Uh, nevertheless, I think we, we must consolidate our positions and cope with a, a, a fierce competition from new players in, uh, in North America or in Asia. And in this context, a uh, European-based institutional initiative will be a cornerstone to, uh, to, to strengthen uh, our industrial capabilities and, uh, and assets. Um, as you know, uh, TAS has a long and successful uh, track record in Constellation. And based on our experience, um, let, me, let me highlight some of key success factors of such Constellation from, from an industrial perspective, uh, of course. Uh, first, we, we believe, and it has already been said, uh, we believe uh, the architecture of such a constellation should be a multi-layer uh, one, combining the best benefits of GEO, MEO, and LEO orbits. And uh, this system should be uh, and should help orchestrating the capacities depending uh, um, on the specific needs of the end users. And to do so, uh, system level expertise and skills are key. And, and TAS has developed in the past uh, such skills uh, in, in the frame of previous uh, uh, programs like uh, Iridium or O3B. The second uh, key success factor is competitiveness. Uh, it is a key criteria uh, to make this service uh, affordable first, but also to, to continue positioning uh, European industry as uh, one of the more competitive um, in, in space, um, in space uh, uh, landscape. A third uh, uh, success factor uh, uh, is to, to be able to structure an industrial supply chain to cope with high volume of satellites. Uh, you know, it's one of the important challenges when you want to produce and, uh, and, and launch uh, uh, satellites for a constellation. To do so, we, we really need to find the right level of collaboration uh, between the prime, the industrial prime, like Telesania Space, and equipment manufacturers and include some innovations that can also be provided by SMEs or, or startups, a very important point. And uh, last uh, important uh, success factor, I think, is uh, to take the opportunity of this constellation to bring new, new technologies uh, that would not be funded by the commercial market. Uh, I think, for example, that uh, quantum technologies is a, is a good illustration of something that, that can be brought through this, um, through this initiative. So, 
in conclusion, we, we know that the ambition of the European space connectivity constellation is, is very high, uh, but we think that it's, uh, it is achievable. And um, you can count on an uh, industrial prime like uh, Thalesania Space to, to be at the forefront of, of this challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marc-Henri. Uh, coming now to Jean Aubert from Utilsat. Uh, Jean Aubert, Utilsat has made some interesting decisions. Uh, can we hear your perspective, please? Sure. Thank you, Arti. And thank you, everyone. Very happy to be here this afternoon to indeed uh, uh, share uh, our thoughts in this discussion. Uh, of course, a lot of this has been said, so I will be I will be brief, but I will echo some of my uh, colleagues um, and just sharing sharing a few thoughts. So first, I would just like to a bit step back and say that uh, we are uh, happy with this initiative with the Commission because I think it's the uh, it highlights the the fact that satellite is really a key infrastructure for connectivity and for bridging the digital divide uh, in the future, of course, in Europe. Uh, and this is, of course, what we are talking about, and, but, but of course, as well beyond. And it's, of course, very obvious for all of us around this call, but, uh, uh, but maybe not so much at an industrial level. And, uh, and again, this initiative precisely highlights this fact. Uh, um, we already knew, we already know that uh, uh, high throughput satellite, high throughput geo satellite like uh, Connect and Connect VHS, we are going to bring to market in Europe, already will play a very important role in the in bridging the digital divide. But uh, furthermore, of course, we do believe that uh, Leo constellation will further add to that by bringing a lot of capacity, uh, adding new features as well, and of course, a low latency, and that that therefore this infrastructure indeed is very key. Uh, for Europe and uh, uh, and the future of digitization of Europe. So that's the first, first element I think we should all uh, celebrate this. My second comment is that um, I think Ferdinand said that uh, before, and, and I, of course I welcome as well, and we are actively uh, uh, working with OneWeb with pragmatic solutions. I think the role of operators here, private operators, is, is very crucial to make sure that this initiative at the same time is very pragmatic. First, it is important to have private operators like Utelsat, SES, uh, ISPASAT in particular as part of the consortium, taking part of the consortium uh, because we are players acting in those markets and investing a lot uh, in some of the market, of course, the commercial part. So that's very important to have us. But it's as well very important to have us because we bring the pragmatism, the understanding of the market. That means that uh, uh, our voice uh, is very important. It is it is heard. So we welcome for our role in this uh, consortium and the the openness of the commission to to that. But it's very important to make sure that this project we are talking about uh, has uh, is, is is as real, as pragmatic, as business oriented as it can be. Um, uh, and of course, our, uh, so, so therefore our presence is, is, is critical here. Uh, it's also important if we want to, to be a potentially private investor, so for potential private investor in the future, that, that would be important as well. My third remark uh, that has not been said is, uh, is a very important one, I think, is, is that time is of essence when we talk about constellations. This is, of course, uh, I think obvious for for everyone, but we see that uh, uh, a lot of projects are moving fast, including first and foremost one web, and we are of course very happy about that. But as well, a lot of non-EU projects, and it is uh, critical in our view that uh, uh, that uh, as we think about this project, and it's one of the key success factor that uh, we lose we we don't lose track of of time. Uh, because we want to make sure that EU uh, is part of the consolidation race and and uh, and has has really a key place into it, and therefore it's very important to have the long term view, but it's very important as well to have uh, the short term perspective, and therefore by the way to be pretty open to uh, different solutions that uh, that uh, that bring uh, part of the solution in the short term, including of course using 
existing assets that was said by, by some of my colleagues, GU assets, MIU assets, LIU assets, but this is, uh, this is very important. And my last uh, point, uh, and I will be brief, is that uh, I just want to remind that UTELSAT, of course, is a, has been, is a, a critical European player, uh, very dedicated to uh, uh, the digital agenda of Europe. We are, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the satellite operator that buys the most from, in, from European industry. I think this is key, 90% over the last years of our satellites bought from European industry. Uh, more than 50% of our launches, so this is key. And as well, we are used to work with uh, with uh, with uh, ESA in particular. In particular, and you know, we just we are just uh, uh, putting into service our satellite Quantum, that is the, uh, the 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 newest, most flexible satellite that has ever been built now in service. And that was, by the way, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, as well to the to the effort and the contribution of ESA, and this is a very good example of innovation at work uh, and uh, in, into play. And so, of course, uh, again, one more reason why we are, uh, I think, relevant and happy to be there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jean Hubert, for your introduction. You made some really good points there. So, if we can bring all of our panelists back, I'd like to dive uh, a little bit deeper into some of the key issues. And I actually want to start with um, a question coming directly from participants uh, to you, Gustav. Um, from Commissioner Breton's speech earlier today, it would seem that the Commission has already decided that this constellation will be a PPP. Is that so? And has the Commission already rejected other options? Well, uh, that's a, a good question. If you look at uh, the objective and ambition we have behind the uh, Secure Connectivity Initiative, uh, and if you look at the final configuration, you will not be surprised that from the, the two extremes of uh, purely public infrastructure that is run only by an institutional entity like Commission, Galileo, or whatever, uh, to the other end, which is a purely privately owned and operated uh, initiative, uh, those both extremes would not work if we really want to provide uh, a constellation for public services, but also for private services, combining public funding with uh, private funding uh, and uh, having a clear ownership and exploitation of uh, the whole infrastructure. That's why the in the Commission's uh, reflection, the public-private partnership is uh, the best solution because it allows us to flexibly combine market actors with public actors, taking care of different aspects of owning or operating or building the whole system. The question, of course, for the moment is, you know, where will be the balance between the, the public intervention, the private intervention? But this is an open question that uh, with our Commissioner Breton, we still uh, will solve uh, in due time. Great. Okay. Um, Christoph, if I can come to you, ESA is a truly Europe, pan-European organization. You have strong partnerships with non-EU countries as well. And I'm sure that many people who are watching would like to know how is the thinking going around uh, Director General Aschbacher's idea of directing a billion dollars of ESA program work towards moving the Commission's idea forward. Can you shed any light on where this might go? Yeah, sure. Actually, you have two questions there. The first one is that, yes, indeed, uh, we have uh, the richness of a vast uh, international organization <laughs> with uh, many member states from the EU, but also from Europe and even from Canada is part of it. It is Arte's DNA, you know, to help all our member states and their companies to deliver in their R&D project, end-to-end -end system development and deployment project, like the quantum satellite from Utelsat and so on. So anytime there is a, a private uh, stakeholders, industry, research center wanting to do something, we are keen to help if, of course, they are backed by the concerned member states. So yes, indeed, this is a very exciting moment where today, we have a flurry of projects from a large constellation, from LDR constellation, from whatever, QKD concept and so on, all arriving on the table because our member state seems keen to support, indeed, innovation in this project. Again, as I reminded, it's not an issue for, for ISA and the ARTES program. We are used to have a set of partnership projects with a subset of our member state. 
Why? Because most of these projects are in support to industry, industry in, in, initiated initiatives, and we are really gathering the public support of the concerned mem relevant member states to this partnership. So it's not at all an issue. It's why I was mentioning today how much we were happy for Europe and for Artes at large to have today three constellation initiative, large constellation initiative under the Artes footprint. Canada with a Telesat and, and Lightspeed, of course, uh, some other member states uh, behind OneWeb and the EU initiative. We have no issue of this. We are only looking to innovation and competitiveness of industry there. We are fully supporting the high level policy objective of the commission for sure, but we are very much focused on our role too, that is support innovation and competitiveness of the industry. We want the European industry to be at the forefront and it is an objective that is fully shared with the commission, of course. So, well, if we have to have different partnership at the same time, we will implement different partnership with different subset of member states on different initiatives. It's not our issue, you know, to determine if this project is a part of the other one or competing. It's not our issue. We are there again to help if it is a willingness of the concerned member state to help innovation, to help competitiveness, to help this solution to be developed, to be competitive worldwide. So not an issue. And really, the, the, when you mentioned the, the, the question of the support that may be brought in due time to the Secure Connectivity Initiative, uh, I, of course, I will not comment on, on what my Director General said. What I want to say, as it was mentioned uh, by Gustave, well, we are in the middle of the preparatory uh, studies led by the Commission. We are very pleased on a daily basis to support the Commission team to make it happen in due time because it, we are quite in an urgent mode. But today I must say we have a limited view. It has to be consolidated by the consortiums about the span, the perimeter of the system and thus the innovation that is behind it. So when we will know what the recurring cost, the non-recurring cost of it is, we will have a better view of how we will finance it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Ferd, um, if I can come back to you again, uh, you're a major player involved in the study for the Commission. Uh, do you think that other new space bidders are compatible with the ESSCS study? Can they offer an alternative self-standing vision in your view? Um, they, they can for sure offer a lot. Uh, I'm afraid, and do not get me wrong, um, a, a vision a vision is not good enough. And by the way, a vision only may be dangerous. Someone told me once, if you have a vision, go to the doctor. So, uh, but on a more serious note, um, I think that, um, uh, and, and first of all, also, I do not really like the, the opposition between old space and new space. I think we are all in the same industry. And at the end of the day, and it has been mentioned, I think, also by, 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 by Jean Hubert and by Chris, it is about talent and it is about innovation, technological innovation, industrial innovation. It's about uh, capital and it's about business model. It's about speed. It's about agility, but for everybody, for the, 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 the guys in the startups, but also for the established um, uh, stakeholders uh, in the ecosystem. Um, and, 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 and therefore, um, I, I think they can contribute a lot. Um, becoming an operator, uh, running such a constellation, um, I, I have ser serious doubts because the entry barrier for an operator, given that we are in a very high capex, capex intensive business, the, the, uh, the, barrier, the entry barrier is, uh, is very high. Now, this being said, I am absolutely convinced that there uh, is something in for everybody in this uh, new ecosystem to be deployed, in the value chain to be managed. There are so many new activities um, which we will have to deal with. So just um, having a, a look at the use cases which have been identified by the consortium, there is so much to do and we as operators, and I'm speaking uh, for SES uh, from an operator's perspective, we do not have the competencies and we do not have the ambition to do every, uh, everything, and we cannot. So we need partners. We need partners 
um, uh, existing partners, uh, new ones coming up. It's not only about space, it's also about the ground segment. The ground segment is very often underestimated. And, and so um, we welcome everybody. And I think really it's about an, uh, a joint effort, a common effort. So um, yes, um, I think they can contribute a lot and hopefully more than a vision. Brilliant. I hope it's more than a vision too, but uh, the response was constructive. And, and of course, there's no, there's no um, substitute for experience, which of course the larger operators have. Okay. Yeah, but sometimes also some fresh light and some uh, fresh dynamic it also, is also helpful. Indeed, indeed. Okay, um, Chris, let me come back to you. you. In your opening, you suggested what would seem uh, to be an ideal scenario to accelerate a, a regional European system uh, that would build on existing capabilities, that would leverage the more advanced status of OneWeb and existing frequency filings of different players. What do you think stands in the way of um, pursuing such an idea of having this kind of a solution? Well, I'd probably have to asked John Hubert whether I had his permission, first of all, but I, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm taking this and, and, and with all of you in, in, in the same way. Um, the only thing that stands in the way is, is traditional thinking. And we're in a very non-traditional world. I was last night with um, uh, a couple of colleagues from US Space Force. They have jumped completely from where we think we are. They see only a multi-layered platform approach with the different operators being interoperably partnering with each other, that they can reach out. They see Leo has applications, Geo has applications. They love O3B for some applications. They really also like the fact that there's you know, competitive tension between the different areas. They, what, what they have said, what they're thinking is, it's no longer about the individual operators. It's about what can you do for us? And if we take the US DOD as the, the tip of the spear point of all of our customers, the people with the most demanding and probably the most money, then we have to say to ourselves, what can we do for the European Commission? What can we do for um, European space? And what can we do for the European uh, citizens? And the answer is between us, an enormous amount very fast, because we've actually got some real talent in Europe. You know, we benefited from it at OneWeb. Yes, we had our, our surprise um, a year ago, but we're just coming up to the first anniversary. We've raised 2.7 billion. We've done 11 Ariane launches. We've launched 358 um, Airbus satellites. We, we are there with the next one due up with Ariane on the 27th of December. We've got two more scheduled in January. We're going to have over, you know, please God, we're going to have over 400 plus satellites into the new year with a threshold of 500 or so to be the global network. And, and the answer surely is um, from a commission point of view, I fully understand uh, Mr. Breton's, um, Commissioner Breton's position, fully understand that. But I, I would just say that, you know, don't let perfection be the, the good, uh, the, the blocker on um, opportunity. And, and surely, right now, um, stepping in using UTELSAT and, and OneWeb and SES gets you over the line to do something immediately for uh, the European people. And then look at what else you can do. You can then have a conversation with our friends at UTELSAT and say, guys, you know, could we do something with the, the filings for um, OneWeb and our, and our friends at SES and say, well, what could we do there? And, and hey, guys, how could the European Commission steer interoperability between the operators? Because that's what our American friends want. They want to be able to switch from satellite to satellite for the different purpose of the different job. I'm preferred will be hearing exactly the same thing. So will Jean Hubert. And I'm certain ESA will be thinking down the same way. And Marc Henri and Thales, no question. You'll, you'll be thinking along these lines completely. There's, there's nothing surprising about it. It's just whether we can all take a deep breath and say, we're going to have to do things slightly different, slightly quicker, um, more agile, all things that we want. And then within, you know, new space, old space, deferred point, there's neither. There's just now space. Now is the time to get on and get this thing done. And within the, the pressure of the budgets and the opportunities that we've got. So so for all of us, the, the imperative is, is not on I'm company A, you're company B, I have to beat you. The imperative is how do we serve the customers? And what's the best mix? 
and, and I, I think from our perspective, um, we would love uh, to be helping the Commission on, on, on what can be done. We don't mind and we fully understand the subtleties if that is led through our friends at UTELSAT. And we'd be very happy to see our friends at UTELSAT and SES having conversations that go along the lines of, hey, well, you know, what have you got and how do we make this work? And I'm not trying to be the marriage broker here, but we've just seen Viasat effectively take over in Marsat for paper. $850 million of cash and $3.4 billion of Viasat paper, which has gone up 100% in a year, and then the absorption of $3.4 billion of debt. That's a major European asset that any way you spin it has just gone. So do we want to be consolidated out of existence or do we want to be part of a consolidation? So for, for Gustav and his team, they've got enormous things to think about, but, you know, we would love to be a strong partner in Europe. I would love to be adding a European flag to the side of the, the fairing. And I would love to think that we can find a way between us where the Leo becomes the European bridge uh, for everything else that's going on. Artie, sorry, I'm doing my usual thing again, but it's... No, no, uh, you're, you're, you, look, everybody wants to comment on what you're saying. I'm, I can't even get oh, yeah. through one round. <laughs> Christoph, exceptionally, you can come in for 30 seconds to comment on Chris's remarks. <laughs> oh, I will have, uh, thanks, thanks a lot. I will have one question, not a comment, I mean. Uh, the European Commission is a customer. They have some needs, very strong needs, clearly expressed, and especially, uh, they clearly identified. I don't want to speak too much on behalf of Gustav, but since I'm also part of the team, they explain some needs that are not satisfied today. So the question is how, maybe starting from what you have today, can you transform it in order to get closer to what the Commission is expecting? Maybe it could be also an interesting issue. Uh, I mean, really from an uh, overall architecture point of view, and really I want to say it's really the, the engineer part of this team that is asking the question. Do you think it is a good question? Or? In, in terms of the bringing the, the the Leo and what we could do to address um, the the concerns and the desires of the uh, European Commission, if I understood that correctly. Yep. So yeah. so I would say, in terms of the Commission, they're quite clear on what they want. They want a public-private partnership. That will be best for UTELSAT and SES and others to to work out how they want to do that. We're we're too new, um, but they also want uh, resilience. They want high quality technologies, they want a driver for their next generation of industries, all of which they can do with us. And they can do it one of two ways. They can start by using the, the Gen 1 satellites as, as they are, and they can have a conversation and say, look, we want to resolve the whole filing thing. So one route for us is to say to you, we want to build our own, we want to land it in our own place, we want to do our own thing, but we know that's going to take a number of years to get to. But can we come to an arrangement on your filings to utilize your filings to achieve our goal? Or do we need to go through the process of trying to find the filings, trying to identify the mill KA, trying to identify other routes that we can go to with the complexities and, and the, the ITU challenges that are faced? So, so really, I, I would say, please, in your considerations, make us a stopping post and, and, and have a listen. Talk with our colleagues at UTELSAT. Talk with SES as well. You know, th there's a reality there. 358 Airbus built satellites in space. And I'm sorry to say Airbus around my friends at Talos as well, but <laughs> Mr. Carpentier and others all, all, all know that I'm a, a fan of Talos equally. I want to see Europe succeeding and I want to see the space industry doing really well. And we'd love to play a part of it. Great. OK, so I would just say here, as we know from the field of space traffic management, there is common sense and the right thing to do, and then there's geopolitics. And I fear, even if this is a European discussion, I fear that we still have uh, uh, the geopolitics, which might might be a little bit louder. But let's see. Let's. I'm, see. I'm just, Marty. I'm sorry. I've just received an email from a regulatory colleague saying Greg Weiler is trying to get back into the mega constellations and is applying for European citizenship to try to apply for a European. Uh, uh, Leo. So I assume that's the Rwanda filing for 327,000 satellites. I'm sorry to share that with everyone, but just there we go. 
Interesting times. Okay, uh, Marc-Henri, let me come to you and then Jean-Hubert, I'm going to bring you back in. Uh, Marc-Henri, you said in your introduction how Talis has great experience in building, building operational NGSO constellations, Global Star, Iridium, O3B Classic, Lightspeed in the future. Do you believe that the EU can build something which is substantially different from other systems? And if so, in what way will it be different? <clears throat> Good, good question. Um, first, this is true that we have this uh, this heritage that you, you you've mentioned mentioned, uh, and in fact, uh, looking uh, looking to to these examples, uh, we see that uh, none of these constellations have have the same business model, the same regulatory environment, the same uh, uh, customers. So in a way, each constellation it's, it adds has its specificity and, and, and cannot necessarily be compared to, uh, to, the, uh, to the other one. Um, but as, as far as um, the European uh, constellation is concerned, I think the main differentiator will be um, uh, security and uh, in a way so sovereignty uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the core missions of, of these constellations. And then one of the challenges will be to, uh, to marry this uh, core requirement that comes from the from the European Commission's uh, with um, uh, other private markets and market needs, and to see how from that we can build. A, a, I was mentioning a, a more global architectures uh, that that can uh, combining the two uh, the two legs of this of, of this story in a way. So clearly, I think the, one of the core uh, requirements are resilience, uh, security, uh, and for that a public investment is absolutely necessary. And from that core, uh, how to expand and build around a, a, a PPP, uh, it's, it's one of the questions we have uh, in the frame of the study that we, we, we are all, work, all, uh, we are all sorry, sorry, working in. Uh, we have various options and that we propose to the to the commission and then we have to see what what will be the next steps in order to uh, to uh, to progress in a way but well, once again uh, not really com not not comp no com comparison between all the constellations that have been uh, built but here we have a new uh, problem to solve a new opportunity and new solutions to uh, to uh, to find out Okay, thank you. Jean-Robert, coming back to you, Utilsat, of course, has a finger in two pies. The Commission appears to have some difficulty with this. Can you say something about Utilsat's strategy with this approach? Uh, how do you see the role of OneWeb in the, in the Commission project? Yes, thank you, Artie. First, uh, first I want to... Indeed, uh, I want to echo and stress what, uh, what Chris said uh, very rightly, which is... Uh, when you when you think about one web, you need to think about today very just concretely, and factually a company that is uh, buying Airbus satellites, European satellites that is uh, using European launchers, and that is uh, delivering a constellation on on French and UK filings. So I think this is uh, this is uh, Chris. You said it, but I think this is important to to remind to everyone. Now, to, specifically to your question, Arty. Um, First, I would like to say that, uh, and of course, no, no offense, but very, very normally, uh, Utelsat is not the only player that has, if I take back your expression, fingers in two pies. Uh, of course, of course, my colleagues from SES as well, uh, you have, uh, you know, we have fingers in O3B as well as uh, the European constellation. Uh, we. You know, Marc Henry. Uh, we know uh, TAS is uh, strongly supporting or behind the uh, Telesat constellation Lightspeed. And by the way, this is normal. So you know, this is normal. We are all players in a competitive industry, private players. We cannot uh, only rely on the public authorities. I would say to 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 go after some initiatives, and so it's quite normal. And in fact, what, what specifically happened in our case is that we announced our investment in OneWeb when the study was already launched. So we were part of the consortium, the study was launched. And so that was a new event and it is completely normal standard procedure. Of course, 
fully respect it. And by the way, I don't have to comment even. But normal procedure that in that case, the commission will review whether we were in ability to perform the study normally, which is why uh, there was those questions at this time. But we can see that we are uh, today absolutely still part of a consortium uh, only a few weeks away from, from, from the end. So um, no contradiction. Uh, I will not repeat uh, part of what Chris said, which is highlighting part of the synergies. And I think that we, we need to be quite pragmatic when we think about synergies and as to utilsat precisely we you know we 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 see uh we see uh are invested in one web and our participation in the european project as as two potentially complementary initiatives there are two uh projects or two uh, yes projects at very different stages uh of course one web uh, being currently uh uh very near uh, market opening uh, the European project being at a different stage, one web primary focus being commercial markets. Uh, this is not probably the primary project of the European project. So these are uh, very different projects, two different stages, possibly complementary, and therefore uh, at this stage, uh, no uh, contradiction on the contrary for us uh, uh, from that perspective. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Gustav, if I can come back to you. Uh, the Commission is arguably a late contributor into this game. And there are still important questions which uh, some of our panelists have offered solutions to. Frequencies, funding are two of them. How is the Commission going to ensure that these building blocks are in place to implement the system? Well, that's the, the whole question about uh, managing such a complex uh, project. and. Uh, that's uh, the reason why, for, for this uh, initiative, we are uh, teaming up with uh, notably the colleagues from the European Space Agency. Uh, quite helpful. Uh, that's why we have uh, commissioned uh, a number of uh, quite large uh, studies involving key industrial players to uh, fully understand and know for, for certain what is it that the technology can offer, what is uh, the mission requirement, how can this be met, what are the opportunities uh, to go uh, outside uh, the threatened path. Of course, here we are working across a number of uh, commission uh, services, uh, be it uh, my service on the digital side, but uh, the discussion is driven by our colleagues from the Defense and Space Director General, which have a lot of experience in this type of uh, projects. They're responsible for the, the Galileo program, Copernicus, and so on. So bringing together uh, our experience, but also by uh, bringing together different actors uh, in a, a clear project management approach, uh, we are addressing uh, issue by issue. The, the one thing we should not forget is it's the um, involvement also of the, the member states of the European Union. I mean, let's not forget that one of the key objectives of the secure connectivity is to provide secure governmental communications and protection of critical infrastructures. So that's where, of course, we are bringing in the, the expertise, but also the, the desire or the, the contributions from the national strategies and the national programs to make sure that uh, at the end we have uh, a secure connectivity, a satellite constellation that is meeting the uh, expectations from the European Union, but uh, more and for all from the European member states of having a secure satellite connection that is covering not only European territory, but wherever the European Union has an interest, uh, that is also in response to the various industrial policies that we have at union level, but also at uh, national level, uh, and would ultimately also contribute to other policy objectives like uh, Green Deal uh, and so on. I mean, the. That's why the discussions are also so challenging it's because the requirements uh, are so diverse. And uh, just to come back to some points that uh, some of the other speakers made about Leo, Mio, Geo, uh, combining with other networks, operators. I mean, these are the, the key technical questions that we are currently exploring in detail uh, through the studies to make sure that when we start deploying in a phased approach the whole system, uh, we can go uh, towards the, the right end and 
having a system that is as quickly as possible up and running, even if this happens, uh, let's say, in phases, depending on the maturity of the technology, depending on the availability of the, the filings, depending on the availability of uh, technology, uh, of the, the funding profiles and so on. Uh, but we're taking this quite seriously, and that's why we're so happy that uh, we can count ex extensively on the expertise of the colleagues on, in ESA and some of the large industrial groups and so, uh, operators of satellite uh, networks to make sure we get the act right, as this is too important for the European Union to fail, as has been mentioned by a number of speakers before me. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Okay, Christoph, if I can come back to you. Um, we know that our European primes are already building and have already built some of the uh, NGSO systems which are out there and they're, they're building some of the emerging ones as well. So those capabilities are already in-house. Where does ESA see the need to finance new developments, uh, apart from quantum key distribution, of course? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, the, the answer is, 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 is easy, I must say. I will be very pleased. Actually, uh, as Gustav emphasized, the consortium are working to devise what may be sound approaches, sound architecture, sound articulation from short-term deployment and longer-term deployment. So we are really expecting to, to have this detailed view to pronounce ourselves on the level of innovation that is behind it. So again, uh, it would be quite surprising to me that the picture that comes out and is not focused on today but really on the decade and beyond is something that is not really innovative and only on, on the shelf of the shelf sorry if it is the case if the proposal from the consortium is to say well we don't only need to reuse what is existing or procure a system that is already existing there will be no new innovation and probably no need for additional funding for this but it's not at all our expectation. We really think that uh, I would say OneWeb One or Telesat, for instance, are the end of the story in the constellation world. And we really expect that the strong support of the Commission and maybe of our ESA member state for innovation will help you, uh, industry, to propose some things that will, as expected by the Commission, put Europe at the forefront in the very uh, aggressive time frame. So, Indeed, if there is innovation that is proposed, uh, again, broadband, but also low data rate mission, and of course, we have QKD that is central, and with a real focus on security and putting the things at a new level of security, well, we are confident that very soon we will have proposals that are innovative, require substantial investment in non-recurring, and if it is, a, if, sorry, this is the case, I'm sure, that uh, ISA uh, will have, uh, I would say, uh, something to propose to its member state in support to innovation and competitiveness of Europe. Okay, okay. So, Ferd, let me come back to you. I mean, we were just talking about innovation and new technologies and what needs to happen. Of course, innovation doesn't have to be about new technologies. It can also be about doing something in a new way, in a different way. Do you believe that there's anything to be gained from cooperation across different NGSO systems that are emerging on the market? Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but cooperation with different NGSO system on the market. Let me come to uh, back to to to, to one comment um, um, from the statement which which uh, Jean Hubert made before I come back to this part. Uh, Jean Hubert rightfully managed that we as ES also has the fingers in two pies. That's correct, but our pie is somewhat different. Um, our second pie or our pie is um, uh, O3B, um, which we own and control at 100% and which we even now operate in an integrated manner together with our geo fleet. And I think that's nevertheless a kind of a difference which I wanted to mention here. Now, coming back um, to, 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 to your question, and indeed at the end of the day, it is about corporations, uh, in particular, looking at innovation, because we need uh, innovative solutions. We need innovation, mainly also, and new solutions, new way of doing things in order to bring the costs down. What we haven't really mentioned now during this panel is the importance of being competitive. 
So yes, it is about infrastructure, but it is not about infrastructure only for many, if not to say for most or all of the customers nowadays, it's about solutions, it's about services. And at the end of the day, it is about the cost per bit and the quality of the service. And therefore, innovation is key. And indeed, it's not about um, reinventing the wheel twice. It have, it's about having a, a pragmatic approach when uh, looking at this kind of corporations, because it's in the interest of all of us. Um, the, 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 the solutions provided by Starlink and or Kuiper will be very, very, very competitive. Huh? And honestly, uh, competing against those is maybe even not realistic. And therefore, we have to, to find solutions and to, be, to, 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 to come up with proposals here which make sense. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, yes, um, it has to make business sense and there are certain political requirements. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's about competition. Okay, okay. Uh, about competition. Chris, let me come back to you. One of your major shareholders, the UK government, made an investment in OneWeb based on its interest in ensuring that it that the UK had a secure GNS cap GNSS capability. How does this requirement fit with those of other shareholders and those potentially of the EU? Okay, you've been listening to Immarsat again. Uh, the investment was not made to ensure a GNSS uh, requirement. That was one of the things they were spinning at the time to try to kill the deal. Um, the the actual uh, investment was made uh, with the reality, uh, as, as I put it to them at the time, that guys, you need to own the table and chairs, and then you can build from the table and chairs. You need to invite people around the table. We need to be the GSM of LEO satellite. And uh, also uh, a new adage, um, uh, we're not about building satellites. Uh, we're about having the factory to do the next generation things. So the, the, the thrust of GNSS was, to, to put it in context, the treasury seeing an opportunity to get out of a promise that Theresa May had made that she would gonna give 6 billion to replace Galileo. The treasury was never ever gonna let them do that. And um, the treasury um, took the opportunity with one web say, oh, um, we won't need uh, any more to do uh, Galileo replacement because we're going to put it on one web. They also told the Ministry of Defense that uh, they wouldn't need Skynet 6 either. And you can imagine the reaction that was involved there. So there was a lot going on last year as well. The reality is that um, OneWeb represents um, uh, uh, yet another flavor of Wyler pie. I mean, the third has the, the second generation, uh, the first generation of baked Wyler pie. Uh, and third has improved the, uh, the recipe, added additional herbs and spices, and made it four or five times much nicer than uh, the thing that, that he got. We have the, 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 the second of those Wyler pies, which is obviously OneWeb, and we're working on that at the moment. And I'm sure that our subsequent flavors will be much better as well, which is why I would love to have some of the, the European flair from uh, Gustave and from Christophe to, to, to help with the recipe for what Gen 2 is going to be. I don't mean to be playful there, but just to, to, to give an idea of what we could do. And then we see just as we're working, this world is moving so fast. We, we thought Viasat would be enough for today. And here's Greg Weiler trying to become French to launch another generation of satellites. Everything is moving so fast. We all know it's moving so fast. Now, now we guys in, in the real space network um, all know it takes time as well as vision. And, uh, you know, if you've got a vision, maybe you need a cure. But, you know, a few years in space and maybe going broke one time or two is, is maybe a good cure. The, the focus should be on what can we do and how can we do it quickly and efficiently now? Not what happened with history before, what did we do with, you know, who loves who and who doesn't. None of that really matters. We have a unique opportunity in Europe to combine the, the qualities of UTELSAT, of SES, the manufacturing base of Europe, the skills of ESA, and, and the, the Commission's vision for the community in Europe and the wider United Kingdom outside the, the traditional base, but still very much wanting to play a part in Europe, to bring all those things together um, to the benefit of Europe. Or we can carry on piecemeal thinking about what we're doing while the Americans roll up all of the opportunities, the Chinese do their own thing, and we all wake up one day and go, what happened? 
what what happened to us? Where do we go? Um, why why is uh, Intel sat knocking on the door of um, SES and saying, guys, you know, sorry you didn't do so well. We're very glad we got the FCC money and we've got another opportunity. So we'd like to merge with you now. And oh, by the way, we'll be in charge. I mean, it's, we don't want it to happen. It's not going to happen because SES is so powerful. But we should all be thinking. How do we get everything to be more integrated? How do we work more closely together? How do we um, put aside past annoyances and past competitive sides and say instead, let's make this really work very well? Because our competitors are not standing still. They, 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 they see division and they see time lags as opportunities. If you're, if you're um, Elon Musk, you know the guy who can tweet, shall I pay some tax or not? And then go, oh, you've told me to pay some taxes. Maybe I'll pay some taxes. It just We're in a different order of speed and magnitude. So to this community here and the wider community that you reach, we've got to come together to get a win here. Not it's, it's not about the old certitudes. It's about a win for Europe, utilizing all the opportunities that exist. And I, I, you know, I would urge you to try to do that. And, and you know, Gustav, if, if it helps to do it through... A combination of uh, Utelsat and you know uh, partnering with SES and drawing on some capability from OneWeb by whatever means you want to. I, for one, will come down to the commission with my Irish passport in my pocket and I will cheerfully talk to you. And if that doesn't help, I'll get my Swiss one out, courtesy of my Swiss wife, and I'll come with the red and white one instead. What, whatever it takes, guys, we would love to be part of what you need to do. Excellent, excellent. You know, um... I, I don't know whether what you're saying is the right answer, but I do know that we need an honest conversation around this topic uh, if the European um, Commission is really going to uh, put this on the map. And there's lots of different elements to that. We're running out of time, but let me, let me move on. Marc-Henri, I'm coming back to you. We know that there's a growing trend for satellite operators to be fully vertically integrated. We Sunweb, Starlink, Cup are building our own satellites. There's also a plethora of new space startups in the small TAS arena, and many of them are in Europe. How does TAS intend to compete in this new world? And can you envisage a time when TAS also launches its own LEO constellation for its own service platform in a similar way to maybe Boeing? Just to spice it up, because I don't think this, in, this conversation has been interesting enough so far. So. <laughs> no, okay. Um, no, no, you, you're right. In fact, uh, the, the space uh, landscape is moving very fast. And, and uh, the examples you, you, you mentioned uh, show that uh, verticalization uh, uh, is, uh, is, is an option uh, sometimes. Um, but well, as far as TAS is concerned, uh, uh, we, we, we do not intend to compete with uh, our customers like uh, Ferdinand, uh, Jean-Hubert, etc. It's not at all the business model we have. Uh, our business model is really to develop technologies, skills, and to factorize this, uh, these uh, technologies uh, through various uh, markets, uh, out of which, for sure, telecom markets, geostationary satellites, MIO, LEO, also observation and other markets. So um, this is uh, our, our business model today, and it is not uh, about to, uh, to be changed over the next uh, uh, months, months and years. Nevertheless, uh, it, it can justify sometimes to, 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 to find ways to collaborate in a, a more vertical manner. And is in, in this context, um, we, we privilege uh, partnership, but not uh, internaliz internalization of uh, of uh, of uh, operating satellites or, or, or so on, but I, I take the opportunity also to um, to uh, to react to, to one of the questions you you, you made uh, uh, previously. Uh, competitiveness is for sure uh, our um, key uh, driver, and you you were asking uh, RT uh, uh, to Christoph. Uh, uh, if there are some ways to, to, to support industry uh, and uh, new technologies, for sure, we have a lot of ideas uh, for that. And we regularly uh, go to our agency, uh, uh, whether it is our national agencies or the uh, European Space Agency. And, and, and uh, in a way, um, we, we try to find the right balance between mid-term and long-term technologies. And I think of, for example, quantum technologies that will not be in orbit uh, within two two years, uh, not at all. We 
first uh, have a demonstration within two or three years and then industrialize it uh, to, uh, to inject it in uh, the European constellation. But on the other hand, uh, being more competitive, it, it, it is innovation and, 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 and a miniaturization of the payloads, uh, being able to, uh, to, to produce uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of platforms. This needs to, to invest uh, to, uh, to 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 use uh, new technologies to and then to be able to um, to uh, to uh, to have the ability to manufacture uh, all this. So uh, yes, competi competitiveness is. Uh, I say that during my introductory word, but it is one of our main main um, uh, concern today, and where we invest a lot. And this is uh, this is does not need necessarily to to have a vertical integration. Uh, on the contrary, we, we think that uh, we we still have a business model that uh, that makes sense uh, in the European uh, landscape and in the in the global uh, space uh, landscape. One of the evidence is that uh, regularly uh, 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 Americans, North Americans companies go and see us uh, so that we can bring these technologies. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay, um, uh, that was an interesting thing. I would like to actually dig a bit deeper there. I might come back to you in a minute if uh, if the organizers allow us. Um, but Jean Hubert, let me come to you briefly. Is broadband to the home via satellite best served by a geo solution like you offer on Connect, or best served by a Leo constellation like Starlink, uh, the European Commission's proposal, OneWeb, and so on? Thank you, Artie. Um... I cannot resist to come back to what uh, Ferdinand said earlier. Ferdinand, mm -hmm. I would not exchange your pie for, for my pie because uh, <laughs> you forgot to mention that you have a Mio pie. I do have a Leo pie. And I fundamentally believe that uh, Leo is, uh, has, uh, has, uh, has, uh, has very serious benefits, uh, which does explain why we see so much investment in Leo. Uh, which uh, probably explains why we um, don't see a, 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 a huge competition from 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 you from your assets today, and so so for that reason I would not I would not exchange. But but then to come back to um, to to Artie, to your question to your specific question um, uh, today um, on broadband we do have um, uh, of course a great solution with our satellites connect and connect VHS that, that are coming to market. It's, it's a great solution. It's cheap. It provides a lot of capacity. It provides a very good performance with high speed uh, uh, throughput. Uh, and by the way, for many applications, uh, take streaming, streaming, which is of course uh, so important and that uh, takes uh, so much of capacity and even time from consumers for streaming it's actually very good it's actually very good as good as leo because for streaming you you know you don't care about uh, you don't care about the latency and, and geo broadband is, is extremely good so uh, no doubt that in the short term uh, geo broadband uh, does offer an excellent solution for the european market in addition the only uh, uh, solution that is coming to the market from Leo is, as we all know, Starlink on the broadband because uh, OneWeb very rightly, it's uh, one of the reasons of our investment very really rightly, will focus initially on B2B. Uh, <clears throat> Chris uh, will confirm. Uh, and uh, Starlink solution, as we all know, offers uh, a price level, both in terms of terminal, but, as well, but more importantly, in terms of monthly cost, that is very high. So we don't believe that they will be uh, very competitive at those prices on European markets. We believe that they will stay at those levels for quite a while. And therefore, um, maybe in the medium and more likely in the long term, Leo will, be, um, uh, will also provide, of course, a good broadband solution. And the complementarity then between, by the way, Leo and Geo will make a lot of sense. But in the short and medium term, we don't think this is uh, this is a critical factor, and therefore um, uh, very happy with the place where, where we are today. Okay, okay, thank you, Chad. Um, if I can come back to you, 
how does the Commission foster a healthy competitive environment at home while also wanting to secure a European place in the global market by supporting SES and other European operators? Yeah, Arti, I think it's, it, it's first of all uh, about being strong and competitive within Europe. And, and um, uh, look at the, uh, the, the American players. The American players, uh, without naming them now individually, they are strong. And it's not only about the operators, it's also about the manufacturers, because they have been supported by uh, the various US institutions, agencies, and then and, and, allowing them to be very strong in the US market, very competitive, and as they were, have been competitive in the US market, they are competitive globally. And I think for us in Europe, the same basic principles apply. Um, we, we need, and I do not want to, to come back and to, to repeat what uh, Chris and, and uh, Jean Hubert have alluded to, but it is absolutely key that within the European Union, we have the strongest possible space ecosystem and once we have this one, we will also be competitive on a global level. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Marc-Henri, I said I wanted to come back to you. I'm going to do that now. You said uh, that there is no intention to compete. But at the same time, it's clear that Airbus and both and TAS both say they have filings that could be used. Um, can you comment on this? You might be the only company which already has a, a BIU satellite already launched. No, no. Uh, I will not comment so long on that. It's uh, it's uh, it makes a long time uh, since uh, TAS uh, invest in filing because it's it's a way to help project uh, emerge. Um, this, is, this is the reason why we have this uh, this kind of activities. So, well, for sure, uh, uh, as far as constellations are concerned, uh, we also have these kind of activities to, to bring solutions to, to our customer. But once again, bringing solutions through uh, uh, skills, technologies, findings, is, it does not mean, uh, 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 you know, competing with, 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 with our customer. So, yes, it is part of the uh, asset that we bring uh, when we want uh, to help a project uh, emerge. Okay. Okay, good. Um, Jean Aubert, if I can come back to you briefly. Um, Utilsat decided to invest in OneWeb as part of a multi-orbit strategy rather than construct your own competing LEO constellation. Um, how does Utilsat intend to integrate its geo fleet with that of OneWeb in terms of operational integration, com commercial product service integration? What benefits will this bring to the European Commission? Sure. So thank you, Arti. So first, uh... We, because I don't think we alluded to that uh, previously, I want to stress the reason for the investment in OneWeb, uh, which we are extremely happy with, is uh, is uh, and the, uh, is the fact that OneWeb has two uh, very structural uh, advantages. One is, of course, its filing, but we will never say how important those filings are because we believe that for uh, Leo constellations they will be uh, just from a management of spectrum resources, they will be uh, likely two, uh, um, two, two constellations in KU band, uh, two or three maybe in K band, so a limited number of resources, uh, constellations. And, uh, and of course, OneWeb holds the highest priority in KU. So this, is, this was one factor why it was, uh, in our in, in our view, a very attractive asset. The other reason is that OneWeb is very early in the market, very early in the market. Of course, uh, there was a first constellation that was uh, that was imagined and uh, and uh, and thought and, and industrialized uh, with more than the, the today more than half of the satellites launched uh, will be early with uh, with Starlink, of course. But that provides for us a very key advantage that. Um, you are uh, you are um, uh, very early to actually capture the first of the opportunities, and as well because we need we know that those constellations will be to we need to be uh, rebuilt every 
seven seven years or so, uh, a key a key advantage to actually think the future duration uh, with the input the first input of the uh, first customers. So that's those are two key advantages, which which is why we thought that it was wiser to invest in one web versus building our own constellation. That's uh, that's very important. Now to your to your question about the. Uh, uh, the uh, what we are doing, um, just stressing that uh, the actual closing of our investment is only quite fresh, uh, only a few weeks ago, and so we are we are working, we are already working uh, with OneWeb to see how we can collaborate, cooperate, both on the commercial side because I think it's very important for OneWeb and they realize that uh, to uh, precisely to fill. Uh, the capacity early and to benefit from what we can do on the commercial front uh, with access to many customers and combining the force is, is critical as well of course our technical expertise is key uh, and in some other domains so we are collaborating but these are very early days and uh, and uh, and and the only thing i would add is that uh, there are probably uh, you know, several horizon of collaboration, but this is, there's a first short-term horizon to be able to uh, sell, for instance, one web capacity through Util Success Force. But yeah. there's a longer term horizon that the hybridization of uh, different orbits, and of course that was alluded to by some of our colleagues earlier, com combining different orbits, and in this case, uh, Geo and, uh, and Leo, um, can make a lot of sense. And so when we think about the second or third generation of products uh, being able to offer a GeoLeo truly hybrid integrated product will in our view be a key advantage but again this is uh, quite early days and so uh, too, too early to say more at this stage. Okay thank you so much uh, Jean Bert. Um so thanks to thanks to everybody. We have gone slightly over time. Um, I would love to carry on, but uh, we we can't do that. Uh, Gustav, I, I hope that you took good notes from all the comments made, and we'll go and knock on the cabinet's door <laughs> and pass the messages. Um, but I want to thank all of you: um, Jean Aubert, Ferd, uh, Gustav, Christoph, Marc Henri, Chris. Chris, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks to the audience for for listening and for asking such interesting questions. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. And I think just to echo what Arti has said there, thank you to all of our panelists uh, for a really, really fascinating discussion. We were able to continue for an extra 10 minutes, but we could have done that for about an extra couple of hours, I'm sure. But uh, but thank you. Really, really interesting discussion. So thank you all very much for that. And Arti, thank you to you. Expertly moderated as ever and really do appreciate that. So, so thank you so much for that as well. So uh, great way to finish day one. So thank you all very much. Um, so yes, that, that is it for the first day. We've had a fantastic first day. We've had some really, really interesting discussions throughout all the different sessions that we've had today. So we've had the four main sessions and the three showcases, of course. Um, yeah, and really enjoyed all of those. So if there's anything that you have missed, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, recordings for all of those sessions are available. Uh, there'll be uh, an email sent to you with a link for how you can access all of those recordings. So anything you have missed, please do go back and watch that again, because uh, I think all of our sessions, we had some really, really interesting discussions in those. So that's about it for today. But we are back here again tomorrow. I think we start at uh, yeah, 10 past nine tomorrow. So you have an extra 10 minutes uh, before we start tomorrow. So 10 past nine, we're starting tomorrow. Uh, so we're starting off with two sessions looking at enabling the safe, secure and sustainable use of outer space, specifically focusing on space traffic management and then on cybersecurity. Uh, before we then have a next round of showcase sessions uh, and then move on to our session six, which is looking at the new space race. So looking at new space and integrating new and maybe more traditional uh, space players uh, together and looking at the opportunities and challenges ahead for both of those. And then finally, we wrap up uh, by announcing our winner of this year's Innovation in Space Award. So a reminder for you, if you haven't yet watched the video for our finalists, please go and do that. The videos are available on the uh, by the menu on the left-hand side of your screen. So please go and look at those videos. 
And uh, then uh, you can vote for who you want to, uh, to see win that award uh, by using the voting on the right hand side of your screen under event. You'll find a voting tab there. So please go and make your vote there. And we'll be announcing which one of those four fantastic companies uh, that have been nominated as the finalists uh, get that award uh, tomorrow at the end of the day tomorrow. So that's about it. Thank you to all of our speakers, all of our moderators, and of course, to all of you out there for all of your contribution as well. Really, really interesting today. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to more of this tomorrow. So wishing everyone a very pleasant evening. And we'll see you back here at 10 past nine tomorrow for the start of tomorrow's sessions. Thank you, everyone. And good night.